many of us are trickling in, so I just want to wait real quick before we get started. All right. So welcome and thank you for joining us for Humanize My Hoodie, Impacts of Activism on Public Health, presented by Professor Jason Soleil. My name is um, Marie Lynn Herrera. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm a graduate assistant within the Division of Epidemiology and Community Health uh, Student Services. This presentation is co-sponsored by the Division of Epidemiology and Community Health and the School of Public Health. Diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, and anti-racism are core values of the Division and School of Public Health. These values are critical to our mission and fundamental to the movement to make health a human right. At this event and in our and in our day-to-day -day work, we aim to foster a culture where every individual that represents the body of the School of Public Health feels valued, supported, and inspired to achieve both individual and common goals. With intent, we have planned this event. However, we know that we can always do better. Please let us know how we are doing by contacting us at our email, epichstu at umn.edu. Hearing from you helps us learn and grow. <clears throat> And as we begin today, we must first acknowledge that all land is indigenous land. This land on which we gather at the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota is the ancestral and seized territory of the Dakota people. For more than 500 years, native communities across what is now known as the Americas have demonstrated resilience and resistance in the face of violent efforts to separate them from their land, culture, and each other. They remain and are at the forefront of movements to protect the land and water and the life it sustains. Grounded in our commitment to social justice, human rights, and, um, and um, sorry, human rights and belief that all deserve the ability to thrive, we acknowledge the critical and necessary work to improve and strengthen our relations with our tribal nations. We must ensure that our institution provides support, resources, and programs that increase access to all aspects of higher education for our American Indian students, staff, faculty, and community members. And I'll now turn over to Ileana. Hi, my name is Ileana, and I'm also, um, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm also a graduate assistant within the Epidemiology and Student Services Division. I'll be giving a brief introduction of our host today, Dr. Jason Soule. Dr. Soule is many things, an academic, a professor, an author, a leader, a role model, but most of all, an abolitionist. Throughout his life, Dr. Soule has accomplished many things, including being a national keynote speaker and trainer, president of the Minneapolis NAACP chapter, where he created initiatives that have led to harm reduction in Hennepin County. Additionally, he was a Bush Fellow, which is a competitive fellowship that invests in individuals who have demonstrated extraordinary accomplishments and tenacity to affect large-scale change. During his time as a Bush Fellow, Dr. Soule focused on juvenile delinquency and recidivism throughout the state of Minnesota. Furthermore, he was involved in the launching of the Community Ambassadors Program, which is a community-based initiative focused on combating crime. And in the first year, there was over a 50% reduction in juvenile crime. Of all his, accomplishment, of all his accomplishments, his work as a co-founder of the Humanize My Hoodie movement has come at a time where unjustified racial discrimination and criminalization of Black and Indigenous people of color can no longer be ignored. Racial injustice is a fodder by which health inequity persists. And as future public health professionals, we must take an active role to combat it. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Soul. Thank you. Thank you for having me, man. Like, powerful, powerful introduction. <laughs> like, like, hey, gratitude for um, y'all having me in this space, man. Um, I'm grateful to be able to share with y'all. I'm not going to glamorize or glorify any parts of my life or any parts of the movement. I'm a humble servant. I'm so grateful to even be alive at 43 because it definitely wasn't meant for young boys or girls growing up where I grew up. So I'm going to take y'all on the journey. So if you could relax, you know, get comfortable, <laughs> you know, put both feet on the floor if you want, like, just relax, you know, I wanna take y'all on the journey. And I'm gonna talk about what Humanize My Hoodie is doing to actually, you know, increase our mental health and increase 
you know, um, just our st stability, you know, and sustainability. You know, it's like many of us perished during the war on drugs. Many of us lost our way, me included. I want to show y'all my time in the cell and what that looked like. So just buckle up, you know what I'm saying? I mean, listen from your heart and not your mind. Don't overanalyze everything. And, um, you know, I'm going to just dive in. Can everybody see this? Y'all can see it? Okay. Um, yeah, so when we think about life expectancy of Black folks, um, you know, most of the people that I know, you know, my white friends, my Latinx friends, everybody know, like, my life expectancy is low just based off the conditions. All of the quality of life standards say you know, Black people are at the bottom, and that's strategic. So, of course, it Im impacts my health. So, I just want to start there so you can understand my context of community, because a lot of times, you know, we read about these things, and we don't really humanize the people, like, who are within these statistics. And it's like, you can look at all of the research. You know, it's like, you think about premature death, man, it's like, man, I know people dying. I know people who had strokes in their 20s. You know what I mean? Like I lost friends, you know, in elementary school, asthma attacks. You got to think everywhere we lived, we all had asthma in Chicago. You know, we all had it. It was just like the thing. You got to inhale. Oh, my God, you OK? You can't, I, like we were saying, I can't breathe a long time ago. If I had an activist and organizing community at a young age, it could have changed things for me because I would have been more optimistic. There were times where I felt pessimistic and I just made things worse you know so when we look at the the research on activism it's like a lot of people burn out a lot of people go hard and fast at whatever they doing and they don't think about that self-care and how important it is you know I tell people all the time like I'm gonna be here for a while if it's based off what I'm putting into this thing because you know it's like I try to collab and it makes me feel good being able to jam with people on their you know projects so I think we creating life affirming institutions and that feels good to me. So, you know, this definitely has the um, health implications in what we're doing. So I want to just share my role to leadership. You know, I'm grateful to have those titles, but there was a time where people didn't see me as anything but a black kid from Chicago. And that carried a lot of stigma with it. You know what I mean? So before you even get a chance to meet me, you automatically have this feeling about me because it's based off what you've been taught and based off the crime shows you watch. And it's based off, you know, the, the articles you read. It's just based off your context to community. So I'm going to dive in. Um, you know, this is my mother and father. They were teenage parents. My sister was born in 75. I was born in 78. War on drugs hit 82. And, um, you know, it was rough. You know, and I don't want to say strong mom and weak father. You know, it's like, you know, my father struggled with addiction from the age of 16. You know what I mean? And my mom dealt with the brunt of a lot of that for many years. That's why she always wore dark glasses. And it was tough. And, um, you know, my father, you know, passed away a couple of weeks ago. So. I'm going to take that down and not say he a weak father just because I need to, you know, let it go. You know what I mean? He, you know, drugs consumed him, you know? So growing up, I was always in AA meetings and NA meetings with him and stuff like that. And it just never made sense to me. You know what I mean? Never, it never made sense how none of the treatments ever worked. He still had overdoses, overdose, overdose. And, you know, he got COVID and, he died, um, you know, in Chicago, and I had to be there for my siblings and, you know, talk to my mom about it and, you know, talk to his, you know, sister and brother, my aunts and uncles, and it was real. So, you know, it's a lot surviving the war on drugs, but it was always that possibility that we would get evicted, we would end up in a terrible situation, and, you know, we could possibly lose our life. So I'm still processing a lot of stuff, just being, you know, fully transparent with y'all, but 
my mom a superhero. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like real talk. She should be giving y'all this presentation because you know, like she worked for the post office for 28 years and I'm um, downtown Chicago too. That's not an easy thing to do, man. People are serious about their mail in Chicago. So shout out to my mom who retired from the post office. Um, but I clung to my sister growing up, you know, she was smart. She stayed out of trouble and, um, it just didn't help me when I started kindergarten and she was in third grade. Cause you know, they just expected me to behave like she behaved. And it was like, she was socialized as a girl. I was socialized as a boy. Those two totally different socializations. Like, you know, like she she taught to move away. I'm taught to move away. She could cry if she wanted to. I'm growing up south side of Chicago. We all poor. Like respect is a big thing because you don't have anything. Like the best thing you got is, you know, some kind of status as far as don't bother me. Like I'm not one, you know, to 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 harm. That's the best thing you got. Wasn't nobody to save us. Wasn't no social workers in Chicago. They, they definitely wasn't at my school. <laughs> like, so it was no help. We had to figure it out. And unfortunately, I made a lot of poor decisions, a lot of fights. Kindergarten, first grade, second grade, got my eye split, fighting twins, split my eye on the fence. I got three stitches, came back. That was second grade. So I wasn't making it easy on myself either. Like I say, my behavior... I just didn't understand it. You know, I was frustrated. I could start out the day in a good mood. One thing ticked me off or I'm jealous or I'm, you know, just being a kid and, you know, it just messed up my reputation. I mean, I was smart, so I always could do the work. I mean, it's Chicago public schools. Like, it ain't like I'm getting a high quality <laughs> education. You know what I'm saying? So I'm breezing through this stuff and I really didn't understand I was smarter than other students. Like I wasn't even like, it just wasn't a thing. Like the test and stuff, like I would prepare, I'd be ready. I do my homework. Once I get home, then I play all night. Like that was my reputation. And sometimes we got, we got in trouble. But when I looked at leadership, I got to see the first black mayor of Chicago. If you know anything about that time, you know, it's Black History Month, too. So it's like, let me definitely double down on Mayor Harold Washington. He had that Obama energy long before Obama. I was a little kid. Like, he was the hope for Chicago. If you look at it, these are kids at his funeral. Those are you. Like, he cared about the kids, and we thought he was going to be our way out of poverty. And then he just died, and it was suspicious. So all them hits we take, the leader that we're supposed to have take us out of this stuff, he was the most progressive mayor in the country. We felt like we were in good hands in this war on drug stuff. And we didn't have the language that it was the war on drugs. All I know is my uncle got snatched up at 12 and he didn't come home till he was 18. That's what I do know. My mom's youngest brother. I'm like, what? You know, so and they sent them to prison with grown men. So you got to think they was destroying us. As a child, we weren't supposed to make it through. They was calling us super predators. Like, you got to think Hillary Clinton, all of them, man, they was talking super predator. I lived three blocks from Jesse Jackson. He never once came to my school, man. I'm like, we in the trenches, man. It ain't no, no, no help. You running for president? So we get to see you run for president in 84, 88. But it's like my generation was just kind of thrown away. The men were sent to prison. So I grew up under radical feminism. Like my mom got five sisters and I got a big sister. <laughs> so it's like, I got a, hey, I got held accountable all the damn time. Like that's just the way it was. So my socialization was a little different than other folks. Basketball was my therapy. And I realized I was pretty good at it at a young age, maybe about 11, I knew I, I, knew I could play. But um, I was 10 years old on this, I'm the guy, standing up all the way over to the left. And um, I got to see Terrence be the leader. He's the one all the way over to the right. Like all, all the girls said he looked like Tupac and stuff. I used to be so jealous. I used to tell him though, I used to be like, dang, man, you, you got it. You know what I mean? Like he was confident. He looked confident in the picture. And um, he was an amazing leader. Like I made the all-star team that year because I, I could just shoot a jump shot. He passed it up. He could break down the defense at a young age. And um, I, I just could shoot. The side shot was my shot. So 
Um, I played in the All-Star game and scored six points. And I was playing up. You know, they were a little older than me. So for me to be able to do that and see his leadership, because he wasn't cocky at all. He was just a nice kid. And, um, you know, unfortunately, he passed a couple years later, got killed. And um, that was just always the reality. It's like death was always around the corner. Like, you just have to expect the unexpected where I grew up. And no kid should have to live like that, man. So I was frustrated as a kid, and I was determined to figure it out. Fifth grade, one of my friends, super amazing person. Um, she graduated from Johnson High School in St. Paul, actually. Um, you know, when we were 10 years old, she ended up killing her father, stabbed him to death. You know, he was beating up her mom, and she, she said it happened so fast. You know what I mean? Like, regret she wished she could take it back but in my 10 year old mind I'm like what the heck you know I'm like this the only girl who can come over my house you know what I mean like I like my mom not having that my mom gave birth at 16 but she damn sure was making sure that me or my sister didn't do the same thing you know what I mean so it was like she was the only one who could come over my house I could go over her house I could talk to her brothers her mom mad love it's love she live in the hood. She live in my neighborhood. So I know a lot of, you know, I knew a lot of people and um, it just didn't make sense. And when I ran into her, what, seven years later, eight years later, I ran into her, man. I was eight, we were 18 and um, we just like, man, we couldn't leave each other because it was like, I needed to know what happened. I needed to know, I needed to like close up that gap because it just didn't make sense. And it was like, was in my mind going forward. I always wondered what happened to her. But this was just our reality. People get snatched out of our lives. Sixth grade, we had twins, Aaron and Erica, identical twins. Aaron passed away of an asthma attack in her sleep. It didn't even make sense seeing only one of the twins. It just, ooh, you don't know the feeling. You don't know the feeling. And it was a feeling where it's just like, oh my God, I can't even call this girl twin no more. I just wouldn't, I like regretfully, I just couldn't face her. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, I was just a coward. I couldn't, if I seen her coming down the hall, we ain't had nobody teaching us those skills and telling us, you know, so it was real, man. They kicked me out. I'm going to say this, man. End of my seventh grade year, I went to the same school, kindergarten through seventh grade. Right before my eighth grade year, I was going to be the captain of the basketball team. We just did well in the district, third in the district. That was pretty good. Um, I, I had been in oratory competitions, giving Martin Luther King speeches on stage, and I was competing. I was very competitive. And uh, right before my last year, Mrs. Keys made a recommendation that I go to another school. And she had a relationship with my mom from my sister. So by the time I got to her, she just was like, she hated me. You know what I mean? Like she hated me when I was a, a lot younger. And I just did not understand that. And um, she definitely got the last laugh because my mom believed that sending me to another school for my last year of like, we didn't have middle school. It's K through eight. That school still is K through eight. And it was like, you don't do that to nobody. Send them to a different school on another side of town. So I went to Kosminski, and I just it just didn't feel right. They didn't have a basketball team. They had a little bit more privilege. So when I think about the school to prison pipeline, the label was already being, like, I was already being stamped as somebody who could be primed to go to prison. I got a mark on my elementary, like, my school record. Cool. I go to the school. I get into a fight when I get there. This kid get offended. We, it's just bad, man. I probably was depressed and everything. I don't know. You know what I mean? But I think looking back, man, I'm pretty sure I was depressed a lot of those days going to school, man. I was beefing with them kids, man. But I made a lot of friends too, you know, and I graduated and I was clean too, y'all. Shining on them. I was shining on them man. <laughs> like, because I felt like I had been through the flames, man. We got evicted my eighth grade year. That means we got kicked out. Our furniture was thrown on the, on the front yard, man. It's the most embarrassing feeling you will have. So to be able to graduate and to pay for that suit myself, you know, it's like I was the paper boy my eighth grade year. 
Chicago Sun Times, man. Those heavy Sunday papers, I was full lugging them things, man, making my little $60 a week. But, you know, it was my own money. So to be able to buy this suit, and I bought a pink tie. And this 1992 Southside Chicago, you got to have some confidence to throw on anything pink. They'll test you. You know what I'm saying? But like I said, I was I was always good in the neighborhood and people know I stand up for myself. Like I'm never a bully, never like I never got that kind of energy. But if you try to harm my sister or myself or my brother, who's seven years younger than me, um, you know, I'm gonna bring the thunder, <laughs> you know. Um, and I went to Dunbar High School. So if you look up Paul Lawrence Dunbar, he was a poet. He wore he wrote this poem back in the day. We wear the mask. So you think about, man, just prophecy man they were young scholars and um never got their credit never got their flowers so with my platform i definitely lift up paul Lawrence dunbar and it was like dope he had that part in the middle of his hair back then like that's fire you know what I mean? so i went to dunbar high school because if you know about dunbar on 29th and king drive dunbar competes it's a competitive school like if you know dunbar coming you know it could be banned it could be volleyball, it could be basketball, football, you know, Dunbar is coming. And I wanted to be a part of that tradition. So I chose Dunbar, which was like 50 blocks from my house. I had to go through so many hoods to get there. I lived on 77th and Ridgeland. Dunbar is on 29th and King Drive. So you got to think of my commitment. And if you look at life expectancy, look at how old Paul Lawrence Dunbar was. You do your math. Sad reality. That's why I said graduate in eighth grade, they know that might be your last graduation. You might not see a high school diploma. It was real for us, man. Jennifer Hudson went to Dunbar. Shout out Jay Hood, man, like a real one. Uh, she was in the band, of course, you know, very skilled with instruments and all of that. Um, Mr. T, trendsetter, trailblazer. I pity the fool. Come on, man. Lou Rawls, too, famous composer. But if you look behind Mr. T, you see those project buildings. There were days on the intercom, they would say, please do not go down 29th Street today. We just had to speculate what that meant. So it was real where I lived, man. It wasn't, we didn't take vacations because we were poor. You know what I'm saying? So my context of community was very limited and it just was frightening at times. But you got to think, those are the projects. Those are prairie courts, the PCs. You got to think, that's lead paint. If a child eats the lead paint, brain damage. You got to think, the windows, not all the way sturdy. You've had stories, kids falling from the 18th floor, dying. Elevators not working. This is mad traumatic, y'all. And y'all know it ain't made up because y'all know too many people around my age who got this same story. Wasn't no safety ramp, man. It wasn't no safety ramp. And I'm not, you know, saying that to like, you know, minimize the harm I caused because I was getting in the game at 14. I'm like, man, I need money, man. I'm tired of this broke stuff, man. It just, my self-esteem was messed up. Like, even though my mom worked, she had to take care of three of us and herself. So you got to think if I'm 15 and I'm playing ball all throughout Chicago, she don't understand how much money I really need to be able to go to these games, buy a slice of pizza afterwards, have a social life. She didn't understand. She, I used to always say, man, you look at prices like you looked at prices in the 80s. I used to like, this is the 90s, man. Like stuff costs more. And then I just put too much stress on her because my father wasn't bringing anything to the table. We weren't even in communication. So it was just a lot for a teenager, you know what I mean? And I made poor decisions, but I let her to my sophomore year. It's like we balled out on all teams. Farragut, Simeon, you name it. If you brought a squad in front of us, hey, that was a great year for me. Freshman year, I sucked. You know, I did not play how I should have played. Sophomore year, I was way more comfortable. Like, I felt like couldn't nobody guard me by the time I was, you know, in 10th grade. I, I, knew, I knew my level at that point. So grateful for that Dunbar experience. But like I say, I got caught up in the game. I just always was given leadership at a young age, like never really wanting it, never saying, hey, pick me. I think I can do. It was always somebody else who said, hey, man, you could lead this right here. Well, I think you I trust you enough to do this. 
You got to think, my mom, she went somewhere on a cruise when I was 15. I'll never forget this. I probably should ask her where she went. But it was so cold in Chicago. She said, Jason, you got to start my car every four hours. She couldn't trust my sister with that responsibility. You know what I'm saying? She trusted me, the younger brother, to handle that because she know, like, she know I probably was going to be out anyway. <laughs> so I, I could just come start her car. But every four hours, I mean, I slipped, I fell asleep, woke up, started, it wouldn't start. My friends came, supported me, helped me. So it just wasn't no gang stuff. It was like, and may, may Omari rest in peace, man. He came. And he was busy, man. He was doing something he really wanted to do. And he put it to the side to come jump my mother's car so I can get back on that four, you know, started up every four hour kid. And um, it's stuff like that that you don't hear about when people are in gangs. But when I got in, you know, I learned a lot of good things, but I also learned a lot of bad things. It's the, it was the war on drugs, you know, like the best way I could put it. And unfortunately, I couldn't hear my mom as good. You know, she was telling me all the right stuff. She was trying to, you know, like, she tried. She was trying to save her boy. Like, real talk. She was trying. Um, listening to my music, trying to connect with me through my music and stuff. Because she didn't understand rap. She grew up with Luther Vandross and all of that <laughs> good music. You know, Stevie Wonder and stuff. So she didn't understand N.W.A. and all the stuff I was listening to, Public Enemy and all that. But she tried. You know, she was listening to it and giving it a chance. And, um... You know, I was struggling. And um, she found an eighth of a kilo in my room. And I was at a camp with the top 100 ball players. So I had a level of success in Chicago where I was recognized for basketball. That was my identity. But the whispers were, hey, he and the gang, he sell a lot of drugs in this neighborhood. And so the whispers were there. And my mom found an eighth of a kilo in my room, scales, baggies. And it just broke her heart because I had been lying to her. You know, like, I probably heard her more than my father heard her. You know, just to be all the way 100 with y'all, like, it was sad. You know, like, I've made it up tenfold. So let me be clear. Like, I've made it up. Ten, I just took her to lunch last week. Like, I love my mom. And I've definitely made it up um, really 100 times over. But at this point, I was struggling. And in order, you know, to follow my mom's commands, because she told me, she wanted me to go to Waterloo, Iowa to live with my aunt, her big sister. And I just was like, man, that is not the solution, ma. And she was like, that's what you're going to have to do. Like, you're not going to be able to live here. I want you there. Please take the. And my gang was like, man, you can live in the building, man. You ain't got to do that, man. It's a career right up there. You got the key, you know. And um, I was like, I'm going to listen to my mom. So I had to get the tattoo on my arm going to Iowa. It's 1994, y'all. So you think about the 1994 crime bill. They were hunting black guys. Still are hunting black guys. And, um, you know, black women too and black children. Um, But it was like going to Waterloo, that was the best place I could have went in Iowa. It had the grit. We had the blackest team in the state of Iowa. When we come through, it looked like a protest, and we just coming to ball you down. That's all we coming to do. We ain't coming to answer no questions. I ain't talking to no media. I'm just trying to score 25 points. Um, I'm the guy in the middle. This JJ pitch, J, uh, Jason Loveless pitcher. So he put the arrow over himself over there, <laughs> all the way to the left. But um, he was co-captain with me. But I'm in between the N and the E. And if you notice, I got an Afro. So when I look at Colin Kaepernick's series, I definitely think about going in Dubuque, Iowa, having an Afro, having a gang tattoo, everybody know I'm from Chicago. And it's like, it's a lot of racism. And I just didn't, you know, I understood it growing up under systemic oppression in Chicago, but to be in a space where a kid might call you out your name, man, look, I don't play that. Like, I don't, I look, no, I don't play that. So going to Iowa, everybody knew I was radical. And just me not eating pork always felt like a battle. Always. They got pork hot dogs, pork, every, like, you know, ribs and all of this stuff. And I used to be like, man, I practice Islam. You know, I don't, you know, eat swine. You know what I'm saying? I don't put that in my body. Like, I was health conscious, you know, and I was penalized for it because it just looked like I was a part of something that they couldn't understand. The status quo couldn't understand me. 
we balled out that year, though, man. Like, I ain't saying we got cheated, but there's footage out there. <laughs> we got third in the state, but we was definitely the best team in the state, 94-95. I don't care who you know in Iowa. You better check the statistics. And I just brought that Kevin Garnett energy to every game. I played with passion. So being out there in Iowa was different. Going to Iowa City, experiencing racism. People just was trying to throw me off my game because I, I could play. But my coach was racist. I mean, he still is racist. He the coach at um, Ames, Iowa right now. Racist dude. I see him. He know what's up. We still to this day. It's like, dude, come on, man. Stuff you used to try and say to me. If I didn't check you all the time, you probably would have got wild on me. So I had all the experiences, man. You know, and it hurt me going to Iowa because my Dunbar team, they lost to Kevin Garnett in the final four by three points. I was supposed to fight that battle against Kevin Garnett. I was a starter. I was a small forward for Dunbar High School. That's my buddy Montice Brown in the middle right there. Um, Montice, a dope person, and his kids balling that. So it's like he had 19 points against Kevin Garnett, and I just let my squad down. So this story comes with a lot of regret because my decision set us all back. It set us all back. Like my one decision to sell drugs. I was supposed to fight that battle at the University of Illinois in Chicago, man. And I let them down. They still love me. You know what I mean? That's the crazy part. And I'm just like, always going to hold that regret, you know? And I was captain of the squad, but, you know, I I didn't know about press skills. I had never had no media training or nothing like that. It was just like, hey, the news here, they want to talk to you about your season coming up. Being a captain, I got to talk, you know? So it was like, I say whatever, whatever I was feeling, <laughs> I said it. I mean, I had some intellect with it, but I just used to say, man, we step on that court, man. I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to, you know, win, you know what I'm saying? Like, I want to win. Like, I'm not just thinking about my personal stats. You know, it's like, I got a lot of rebounds, a lot of assists, a lot of blocks. Like I never was a ball hog, always been a team player. All four years I played as a team player, no individual stuff for me. Homecoming. And they're throwing up a five-point star. Got into a fight that night and everything, man. Like, not showing my best. The gang stuff will come out. Drinking, just doing stuff I shouldn't have been doing. And like I say, those poor decisions would, would hurt me. But I signed up for the Air Force. Um, Felt like they said I could play basketball and, you know, be able to make a good living. So me and my friend Corey Taylor, I go back. Corey, the one right there in the middle with the polo. So I was just with him two weeks ago. We still, we still all down. You know what I mean? Like, I ain't never lost my, I got too many day ones. Like, you know, but um, we were supposed to go together. And, you know, just a few years ago, you know, he finished 20 years of, of military service. You know, he was all in, you know, Alaska living in Alaska three years. Then he was in Germany for, I'm like, what? I'm like, how you doing this? South Carolina. And, um, it just hurt, man. We supposed to take that trip together, but you know, it's like I enlisted early. I passed all three physicals and I passed the written. I scored over 40 and they said Air Force was the highest branch. So I felt proud that I got accepted. And then they just rejected me because I had childhood asthma, never had any attacks or anything after 10. And I ran in Drake relays. So I was running amongst the highest or the fastest runners in the state of Iowa. That's one of the biggest races. Like, and that's factual. You can look that up. I ran in Drake Relays 1996, same year Mike Johnson ran on that track. He ran on that track, and I got to see that. And, like, I ain't got no parents or nothing with me. You know what I'm saying? I got, like, drug dealers and stuff in the stands for me. You know, it's like my friends coming to see me. They might be my ride. <laughs> so it's like, hey, take me to the game. I can't drive. I crashed my car my senior year. It was a lot. I was in the flames. My aunt kicked me out. We wasn't getting along. She struggled with mental illness and still struggles to this day, unfortunately. But back then, it was like I had to just fight my battles myself. I had to be the responsible one because it's like I'm given a responsibility of captain or, you know, I'm a leader. I'm a senior on the track team. So I got to look out for the sophomores and the freshmen and, you know, be responsible. And um, I took care of all my business and they still rejected me. So I felt like I got cheated because. You look at the documentation. I was enlisted, and I don't know what happened. So I became a soldier in the streets. 
It was real for me. You know what I mean? Like I lost myself probably dealing with, like I say, depression. Um, I just felt bad, man. I played, I like, I graduated on time. I never failed a class in high school. How am I out here with the pistol on my waist like this? Come on, man. Like, it didn't make sense. I was frustrated. If I got the discipline to play four years high school basketball and never fail a class, that lets you know I can do something. But they never wanted to invest in this black boy from Chicago. Never. So my cousin said, hey, come to Minnesota, man. Because when I got sent to Iowa, he got sent here. He played basketball for Dunbar, too. And, um, you know, he got sent here when he was 16. Yup, 16 years old. And I came down here and we just, you know, got back to what we knew. You know what I mean? Like, we ain't the best of people. Like I said, I'm selling drugs, so I'm definitely poisoned in the community. But we took care of a lot of people, too. You know what I'm saying? So it was a contradiction because on one hand, it's like, yeah, we got to do this to make money. But on the other hand, it was like, dang, at least you ain't going to get evicted. So we was conflicted, man. It was no opportunities, and it was just a lot of drugs. I wanted college. I wanted – I knew I could do good at stuff like that. And I got shot up I was about 20 years old, man. I got shot on University Avenue. They were trying to kill me, man. Like, I was at war. I had beef with people. And, um, you know, they sprayed me, broke my femur bone. And um, all of these things, man, like going to the hospital, none of the nurses or none of the doctors could really ever see me as a victim. I had braids. I had tattoos long before people had tattoos. You got to think 1994, I got a tattoo. Then 97, I got big tattoos like <laughs> on my arms right here. Like, so it was like before people was really seeing that like that. It was like, shoot, I wore braids in high school. It was like we was Allen Iverson before Allen Iverson. <laughs> and it was just like, so going to the hospital and I got tattoos and I got braids. And they already saying he's in the gang and all of this stuff. I never could be seen as a victim. All these things take years off my life. I'm shot. I'm actually the victim. No matter what you say or how you look at me, I'm actually the one harmed here. And that just led to more trauma. I know what slavery is. When we're talking about Minneapolis police and no knock warrants, it's like, man, they never knock. These are 12 gauges to the face. These are posters they putting on the side of the highway. And I've never been arrested for anything violent. So it's like, how am I getting all of this treatment? And you don't got no, like, no violence on my roughing me up, pepper spraying me outside the club. Everything didn't lead to a mugshot. I've been choked by the police. And I can name names. Some of y'all know I've named names plenty of times, like, of these officers who always was trying to, I mean, it would be 300 people when we leave the club. And out of nowhere, I could be having the best time laughing. Grab me, throw me all down on the ground. Wait, what is going on? No, we need you. We think we heard you did something. What? What is this, man? Never understood it. Pepper spray thrown in the back of the car. Me and my friends, some of them not alive to this day. We in the back seat. They had reckless police stuff. This was before we had the phones and stuff. Man, nobody understood these stories before George Floyd got killed, man. I've been talking about this stuff, man. I'm no angel, but what I dealt with with the police led me to be in, like, I was in a 52-minute high-speed chase with the police. You got to think of a 52 minutes. Man, I know they'll kill me. So I'm trying to be somewhere where everybody can see it. Whatever go down. That was always my mentality with the police. I knew they'd kill me. Cause they used to just do the most bogus stuff to me, snatch my tent off the windows, no probable cause, nothing. And um, I realized it was just slavery. I went to prison for 40 months for something that could fit in your hand. No restorative justice. All they kept asking was how much time. I got caught with a firearm three weeks after my 19th birthday. I just got the gun. I'm not in commission of a crime. Somebody threatened me, pulled out a gun on me two days prior, but you can't really say that in court. You know, I didn't know my laws. I'm ignorant to the law. And we know that's not a defense in the court of law. So I'm like trying to rely on my vice 
all they ever asked was how much time. Nothing about a high school diploma, nothing about, you know, athleticism, nothing about the awards. I, I received awards in high school. I had to go to like banquets and stuff. Nothing about none of that. It's just a black kid from Chicago, nine millimeters. So it's how much time in the cave? Caught with drugs. Another no-knock warrant. Came in my hotel for a driving warrant. Revoked my license and came to pick me up because my license. They didn't even pull me over. They came to actively get me. I didn't understand all of that, man. It took a while for me to understand how slavery worked in the 13th Amendment. It took a while. So I was studying even before it became a real movement around this stuff. I was like, man, what was Angela Davis talking about? Malcolm X, what he stood for? I read the autobiography of Malcolm X. Mandela, hearing stories like that. And when I came home, it was a struggle. My PO was a jerk. Um, so I went through slavery. Then I had to experience the new Jim Crow. Couldn't vote. Couldn't get a nice place to stay. They put me in a part where it says projects. I'm applying at nice places. I thought I can get a nice place because I felt like I paid my debt. I felt like my debt to society. I went to prison. That was a 40 month sentence. If I go to prison, I'm thinking I come home and it's all forgiven. It wasn't like that. So I, I got out here and really like got active. You know what I mean? So after, and I got filmed for eight months by Hazelden. They documented my struggle for eight months. So I do got a film that shows my first apartment, me working at the Holiday Inn, just struggling, you know what I'm saying? But I was determined. And one day I just drove into Metro State and that's when everything changed. I wasn't even planning on going to Metro State that day. I was about to hit North Minneapolis. Like I was smoking some marijuana and just, that was not the plan to go to the college. I'm just being hundred percent honest. Because when I walked in there and I met Bruce Olsen, he was like, man, my God. He was, I was like, yeah, just irresponsible. I wasn't even <laughs> planning to like sign up for college. But I'm glad I made that decision because that's what I needed. I didn't need prison. I never needed a cage. Of course, I had leadership when I was in prison. I'm not about to be in here like being victimized. And no, I'm trying to create a standard. Ain't no thieves going to be in this unit. We're going to have a level of understanding or we're going to, you know, figure it out one way or another. Like, that was always the way I showed up. And I'm not a super tough person, but I'm always about safety and accountability. You know, I met a lot of friends in prison because I said, no, y'all don't need to fight for that. Like, explain what you need. Explain. Come on, man. Like, so I've always been known as like a hood referee. You know what I mean? To be able to say, no, hey, look, if it's serious, let's go at it. But it's like, no, man, like, let's have a standard. My advisor became Chuck McDoo. And he part one of the founding members of SNCC. So you talk about being, you talk about a miracle or a divine intervention, having him as an advisor changed the game. He, because of his connections, I was able to volunteer for Angela Davis in 2004 in Minneapolis. That's a fact. So you got to understand I was already on like an abolitionist framework because I knew we could do other things. I had already been I already had some juice as far as the streets went in, in, in the Twin Cities and in Chicago and in Iowa. So I could easily say, hey, no, nah, ain't nobody about to do nothing like that, man. Like, I didn't have the ultimate de-escalation skills, but I had some. Going to college allowed me to be around Julian Bond, who fought for the Voting Rights Act. So now my circle and my leadership has actually changed. I start hanging with these squares in the middle. <laughs> no, I love them. And they know I talk stuff. We still friends to this day. Karen Monahan, Siobhan Johnson. I just got off the phone with her. I was on the phone with her when we started, you know, um, when we jumped on at 445. That's who I was talking to, her right in the middle. And Hosey Thurman, you know, these are my people. So I found my tribe. And we were already talking about Black liberation. You see Dr. Rose Brewer, U of M professor. She's on this panel. This is 2005, y'all. So we were already talking about Black liberation. Before the BLM movement, we were planting a lot of seeds out here. Dr. Sam Grant, Dr. Keith Mays, also U of M professor. Hosey on that panel and Elder Kwasi. So I was already organizing. And like I say, it just came. We won awards. Marion Wright Edelman, who was the civil rights attorney during the civil rights movement, Gave me my first job at Freedom School working with kids. Like, she gave me my first job to work with kids. I taught third through fifth grade. We had to go to Tennessee for a week-long Ella Baker training. 
he had to climb a tower and everything. And I got an amazing story around that. I'll say that for another time. But I rep Minnesota when I got to the top of that tower. I set a standard in that place. And um, I could see myself doing different things. I was no longer feeling like a felon. I could do stuff that made my family proud. And I was I was working. Uh, down in Brazil presented me with an award. So I was figuring it out and I started helping kids. This is a 2005 article. So I was already about mutual aid. I was already on that, on that wave because I was around revolutionaries. I graduated, you see, I'm wearing a Kente cloth, doing it for the culture. And um, I got a degree in three years because I, I mean, I was going insane. One summer I took six classes. Think about that. Once I got the hang of college, Oh, man, one semester, I won three scholarships. What was that, $5,500? I pulled up on campus the next week. Those speakers was banging. I was, <laughs> I was young, man. I was single, man. What was I? Um, 26, 25? Man, I'm man, trying to live a little bit. And um, Bradshaw still one of my supporters. So shout out to Bradshaw because he saw me fighting them battles, going from streets to actual success and having a career. So shout out to everybody who believed in me back then, for real, because it was bleak at times. Even I had so many legalities that even when I got my diploma, I had to go to a jail cell. I couldn't even celebrate that night. And I got a degree in criminal justice. This was revolutionary. Every class I went to that was a criminal justice class, I had on Fred Hampton, Emmett Till, like Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth. So all them future cops, they felt me. So if y'all know somebody who was in them programs 2004 to 2006 at Metro, I represented for the culture, for real. I was president of the Black Student Association, too. And I set a standard. We got to get our grades right. We can't fight if our grades not right. That was always the way I showed up. But the best thing about college is I met my wife, man, my life partner. Yeah, we had corrections class together. And her brother had been incarcerated. And we bonded, you know what I mean? And it was like, I'm grateful to have met her. She got her master's from the U of M. She chose the social work route. You know, I chose to stay with CJ, you know, or looking at justice. And um, my life improved, you know what I'm saying? My babies are amazing, grateful for them. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm father of the year every year. You better believe that. Like I'm very active in my kids' life. Like I told y'all, like I practiced Islam growing up. So man, like doing this is just mad corny. <laughs> no disrespect to everybody who die hard Halloween fans. But for me, if I'm knocking on doors, I'm trying to get somebody elected. That's how I roll. I don't knock on doors for three pieces of candy. No, it's against my values and my principles. But um, I'm going to speed it up a little bit. But I want y'all to feel like a lot of times they was trying to disrupt the Black family. And it's like, man, I always said, I'm not going to be a public success and a private failure. I do the work at home, for real. Like, even when I don't want to do it, man, those girls run me. Like, for real, like, they keep me on point, for real. Very active in their lives, man. You know what I'm saying? I'm grateful. They are blessing to me. I've done restorative justice. I found restorative justice 2006. I got trained in as a circle keeper. So I learned from indigenous communities on how to keep peace using the talking piece. And we were grounded in it. You know, a lot of people have co-opted restorative justice, but I know it in its truest form. When I got trained in, I started actually facilitating circles in prisons. Um, Y'all might have heard about the shooting at, at SEC in Richfield. I led circles there 2007 to like 2013, built a studio in that place. I got like, when I found restorative justice circles, I did it everywhere. You saw me over North Heritage Park led circles there for two years. So I've really done my work in community. That's why a lot of people know me, man. Cause it's like, it ain't just people know of me. People actually can say, I know him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm 13 years deep as a professor. I started teaching 2009, started at Metro State adjunct. Then I became an assistant professor. Culture wasn't, you know, what I felt it needed to be. I came to Hamlin right away. They picked me up, and I'm grateful. That was a good move for my career, for my family, for a lot of things, just a better better fit. I can do all of this and know that the president ain't going to call me. We stood up for Jamar Clark, held a precinct down 18 days. You think about Philando getting killed. Come on, man. Killed him in 74 seconds. 
No, man. So I build and I fight, man. Like, look at the squad. Look at the squads under my leadership. They go on to do amazing and be amazing leaders. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's what I bring to this stuff. And I'm just grateful. When I came up with Warren Forgiveness Day, I made sure the squad ate. I took no money off of that. And I held right up the grant and pitched the idea to the judges. We cleaned up 230 warrants on this one day. It's a lot of articles written on it and stuff. So, and it's becoming a statewide model. I partnered with the ACLU to bring that. And, you know, definitely it's a model that's still going. When Mike Brown got killed, of course, my family out there. You got to think, my baby was like two years old. Jaleel was about two on that picture down there. And um, she's 10 now. So they understand this stuff from a place of you stand up and you speak up when it's your time. Live your life. Be fun. They the best friends. They, they, I got some amazing daughters. They've transformed me. So to be able to take them to stuff that matters, to show them, like, I didn't really want to wear this ancestor piece. Anybody who know I was supposed to be security person. This was what, 2016? Yup, 2016, man. I wasn't supposed to be wearing that. That thing like 40 pounds. Like I felt very unsafe with that thing go. But I did it because people felt like I can give it the energy we needed to go down here knowing it was a lot of racist people waiting on us, man. But we was we was pretty deep. So and this is what democracy looks like. And maybe Mel Reeves, rest in peace. I mean, you see him front and center looking down, passed away a couple months ago from COVID. Oh, it was last month, you know, from COVID. So may he rest in peace. And it was like, I was riding for the cause and I felt like I shouldn't be silent about the stuff that mattered. So I listened to the ancestors. When they tried to build a prison for juveniles, stood up against that. A lot of times I was coming straight from the classroom to, you know, a strategy that I helped organize, you know, the protest. And this was just, man, I don't even know what to say about this, but to um, be recognized by John Legend, you know, somebody who stands up for stuff and he makes beautiful music, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I, I don't know if I can call him an abolitionist. I don't know if he'll be mad, but, you know, definitely he feeling the work that I do. And, um, He's done events at Sing Sing Prison, and he talked about his mom being incarcerated. So maybe I transform him on some level, but I know he's watching everything I'm doing. I know it's a lot of people who believe in me at this point. So I'm just grateful to be able to be at this point. So now I get to flex about humanize my hoodie. I might need to at least do this for about 10 minutes <laughs> because um, it's so dope, and I'm so grateful to do this with a friend. Um, I had been teaching eight years, and I was a visiting professor here at Hamlin. And I wanted to lift up Trayvon. And I just wanted to talk about the differential treatment I received when I got on a hoodie versus when I got on dress clothes. You know what I mean? And it just wasn't fair and it didn't feel right. So I said, this semester, I'm teaching all three of my classes with a hoodie on. This was 2017. I said, I'm not, I'm not wearing no suits. You just got to deal with me how you got to deal with me. I know this might be weird. I might be your first black professor. You probably never got taught by somebody who got three felony convictions. Um, you probably don't haven't learned from somebody who's restorative and want to repair things and figure things out. And uh, I was just putting a lot on the line. It was a lot of risk. And, um, you know, I took this photo with my family and I just hashtagged and humanized my hoodie. And that was the start of the movement. I stacked them books up. You can see I got on my Black Lives Matter hoodie. You can see my beautiful family. It was like, you see me as a father, husband. It's like, man, the books I'm using, New Jim Crow, Just Mercy, Races America. I was going in, you know what I mean? So my friend Andre Wright, you know, childhood friend, like I say, he was my first friend in Waterloo, Iowa. He said, man, you know, I'm in the fashion industry. Like this can be beyond the classroom. Like, let's, let's do it, you know? So we had to get it trademarked right away and take care of the business side of it, talk to lawyers, all of that. And um, that was the birth of this movement. This is us at a conference. He was nervous about this because he never sat down giving a presentation. So we transform each other because when he said, you want to go do New York Fashion Week, I'm like, absolutely, man. Shoot, like I'm competitive. We're about to do this. But he did a lot of hand holding for me to feel comfortable because I'm like, man, we can't go out here and mess up our brand. So me putting him on a platform where we talking about justice and movement work, he trusted me to guide us. 
New York Fashion Week deals with foot action and all of that kind of stuff. Warner Music Group. Probably see we collab with Colin Kaepernick and Warner Music Group all together. He got to hold a lot of that stuff because, you know what I mean? That's like industry stuff. And I'm not really an industry person. You know what I'm saying? So we got to trust each other and grow together in this. And it's like all our only job is to create more leaders. College campuses all over the world. And that kid in the middle, man, that kid, man, that kid like six, seven, nine. He's a baller. Like he's a hooper. You know what I mean? Like 25 points and stuff now. But even back then, he said how inspired he was by the brand. When we get to be around people like this, this was before the pandemic, man. It's like we moved the culture. Louis Blaze, all his people gave him the game, took photos. This is Black Joy. Sir Lisa, we can uplift people in our community right now. They don't got to pass away. So it's like humanize my hoodie. We get to challenge policies at malls because if you got on a hoodie in the mall, they'll treat you a certain way. But ain't this beautiful? Come on, man. These students at Lucy Laney, man, these kids be fighting battles for them to just take pictures on their own and just, you know, do it in front of the art. I mean, come on, man. Feel like it helps their mental health and makes them hopeful. You know, so feel good to be able to do that, man. He's like, come on, man. When we come through, humanizing my hoodie across this world, people vibe with it. It's for the culture. And it's like I dreamed of stuff like this when I was in that cell and they told me I wasn't nothing but a felon. I knew they were lying to me. I'm like, you better just get out of my way. Like, come on, man. Like, man, we designed these custom for these girls, man. Made them feel good, man. It was like they team colors and all. They flexed, man. Do their own photo shoots. You see the flag behind them. Man, this stuff be real. And, of course, I got Bieber in here twice, you know what I'm saying? Because everybody go crazy over Bieber. I was just like, people calling me like, did you get a chance to meet him? It's like, man, I'm not trying to meet Justin Bieber. Like, come on, man. Like, I ain't know if I don't fan out over people like that. I'd keep my cool and just acknowledge them for their beautiful talents, but I don't do all of that passing out stuff over people. But shout out to Rez Chapman too. You know what I'm saying? Anytime he called me, I give him stories for WCCO Life. So I got my people where if I'm trying to get my message out, I got the ways. This Miss Iowa, Michaela Hughes, you know, playing her violin with the hoodie on, man. We got pictures of Kid Capri on the Breakfast Club. And like I say, man, it's like, Beyond our wildest dreams. This Dr. Iggy, you look at Dr. Iggy, he be popping on TikTok. He wear humanize my hoodie all the time. I should have put a picture of him up here in it because he's an actual doctor, a surgeon. To get on the phone with him is like, just wow. Yeah, he's super dope. Nia Wilder, if you go to go through Waterloo, Iowa, she got the clothing spot. She a council person. Nia dope. She represent Waterloo. Uh, we put out a documentary. Road to New York Fashion Week, how we did it. It's pretty dope. 28 minutes. People be rocking with it. We got trainings that we give to folks. If you want to be an ally as an educator, where it's like, if you're in the classroom, you should know how to be an ally to somebody who could potentially be oppressed in your class. So we break that down for you. And I don't actually facilitate them in the Andre Dome, but we got like paid trainers we contract with to do the work, people we rock with. Like, look at this. These are educators, man. That's our Native American sister, Melanie Hester. She's super dope. Got on the Tupac joint. And like, it's like to lift up these amazing women across the country. It's dope. When we go to our towns, man, this helps us heal. This helps us grieve. And when I'm around them, I'm teaching them about their rights. That's the only reason why I studied criminal justice in college. I didn't know I could get a job or a career in it. So I go back to the neighborhood and I get to, you know, pass some information to them. Like I say, man, we got plenty of pictures, man. Like this 200 people. When you really look at these kids, man, some of them throwing up their fists, some of them looking direct, some smiling. Man, stuff is real, man. The vibes are crazy when we come through. Like people see human eyes in my hoodie. They don't even know I'm the uh, <laughs> co-founder of it. I love it. They just be like, man, that's a nice city. I'd be like, thank you. I never say like, hey, I started it. That would be weird. You know what I mean? So it just be like, man, I appreciate it. Nice city. Thank you. I just receive it and keep on going. But it's like for other people, it just means so much more. And they recognize me from it. Because now, even though I got degrees and it's my 13th year of teaching, people know me as the hoodie guy. They be like, hey, you the hoodie guy. I'd be like, what? Man, I'm putting all this work out here. <laughs> like, but um, 
Shout out to ancestor Nipsey Hussle. You know what I mean? Like he loved it. Was always around it. This backstage at the um going bad video shoot with Meek Mill and Drake. So that's a big deal. That's Alana Arrington, supermodel. Like this, this could mess up her brand, but she wear it because it's that powerful. She feel it. She feel a message. These students that I think you and I wilding behind some of our art. Look at that art behind them at the bottom. Come on, man. We get to lift up, you know, people, you know, it's like show the best sides of our people. Look, this Nipsey again with Jamal. You know what I'm saying? So it's like this stuff real. Like I say, shout out to the beef for giving us that look again. I know y'all love the beefster and all of that. Um, Voices for Racial Justice. I've been on the board there for four years, I want to say. Maybe a little longer. Um, but we don't only think about the tree or the village. We think about the roots. So that's why you see the art look like that. We care just as much about what's at the roots or underneath the surface than what you see. So we always talk about making sure the soil is fertile. You know what I mean? We always talk about that in our meetings. And it's just very easy to be on the board there, man, because it's a dope squad. So it's like, man, I mean to be looking like this, man. A squad is tight. So for me to be at my point in life where I could organize with the people that I just want to organize with, do humanize my hoodie with a friend, like that's tough because it's emotional and we love each other. When I can rock with people like this and organize with folks, it's liberating. I can add my stuff. They add they stuff. We all deal with our childhood trauma, our personal trauma. That's Autumn Brown at the bottom. She our board chair, man. If y'all, she's a hell of a, she transformative justice to the core. Y'all might know her sister, Adrienne Brown, who wrote Emergent Strategy. Like, we got a good thing, man. So I'm just proud to find a community like this. The art is crazy on this stuff. The research, how we look at the ancestors, how we talk about healing justice. Like, I ain't put slides in here about my group rep, but I'm a core member of rep, relationships evolving possibility. We answering our own calls Fridays and Saturday nights. We all abolitionists and we got a tool where we can answer calls to be able to love you to your next step. So it's like we being creative in all the spaces that I'm in. So it's like, it don't even feel like work. You know what I'm saying? Cause it all coalesces. So I'm grateful. Like it's real love, man. That's Danny Givens, man. He, you know about him when he was younger, he got shot by a cop and he shot a cop in return. Like he got hit, did 12 years in prison. And, um, He's an amazing person, man, doing the work, helping keeping the community safe. Our artists, man, they show up in a lot of different ways. So we make it easy for you to co-struggle with Humanize My Hoodie. This might feel morbid, but this is the reality. I could be walking to my car after this presentation and have to like really like tighten up. You know what I'm saying? Like that's very real. You know, they don't know what I do. They don't know who I am. You see they ran in there like, come on, man, killed that boy, man. Think they won't do it to me too? They will. So the art speaks. So when we think about youth development, if y'all, I know a lot of y'all might work with young people. Make it easy for them to jam. I can never create a comic. <laughs> it's not my skill set. But when young people say, hey, what y'all think about this? And this is just dope, man. Like it's small, it's short, it ain't saying a whole lot, but it's like People love comics. To be able to explore that with young people who say, man, I might want to try this, man. We with it. We make it easy. Andre shows them screen print. You know, he showed them fashion design, graphic design. I get to talk about knowing your rights. If you don't know your rights, you don't have any. We get to rock with our indigenous people. Christine is super dope, man. If you're in the state of Iowa, man, and you want to rock with a super bad, like, Native American person, man, Christine is the homegirl, for real. Like, a lot of solidarity there. Um, we got to pay Hubbard scholars to answer the phones of young people in the pandemic. You needed homework help? These amazing scholars, all you of them, folks. Charles, all the way to the left in the front row, he just got his PhD. So it's like, man, we when we get to move the culture like that, it feels right. Um, like I say, man, these young folks know how to set up these shoots. They know how to get access to space. They come up with the concepts. We support them. Documentary screeners, we come through, man, like show the documentary, give them hoodies. Hey, what y'all want to do, man? We rocking with y'all. If this makes y'all feel good, give y'all hope for the next four months, get you to the end of the school year. Let's ride.
we signed our first college athlete in Dane Belton. Now that you can actually sign folks, humanize my hoodie, this is the first athlete that we signed. He's a scholar athlete too, just a beautiful person, man. Parents come to every game. Um, he's going to be entering the draft. You know, he's dope. You know what I mean? He's a starter, you know, for University of Iowa from Tampa. We had to talk to his agent and be patient. We came up with a 50-50 deal. Well, this young man can make money while he's in college. That's how it should be, man. You know, it's like, he shouldn't mess up his body and do all of that stuff just for the university. He should be able to, you know, have his own business too. So it feels good to be able to do that. Like I say, when these kids taking these pictures, man, these young scholars taking these photos, it's overwhelming. It's easy to bring them into this because they see themselves in another light. Grateful for that. I could show y'all a million pictures. I'm not even going to lie. I can, they say a picture's worth a thousand words, man. These young folks, man. They beautiful. They brilliant. It brings, you know, solidarity, camaraderie, and it forces conversations. I know a lot of people have said, I thought something different of you, and I just need to apologize. We've had those conversations where people say, man, somebody came up to me, they read my hoodie, and they just said, hey, I feel you, and I see you. Like, so I might not know the full impact of this, but um, I get a taste of it, you know, while I'm alive. So I'm grateful, and I'm principle-driven. I'm not driven by money. I'm not driven by status quo or what people tell me I should think and how I should be. No, I'm grounded. I listen to my elders. I listen to the ancestors and I listen to you. I listen more than I talk. You know what I mean? So it's like that empowers me. I take a lot of calls from people in prison. So these are just some of my values. You know what I'm saying? I've been talking about defunding the police. You got to think I worked in the mayor's office in St. Paul. And I resigned after 10 months because, I, like I said, I'm serious about my work. I know I perfect my craft. I know safety and accountability in ways where others don't. I was in the gang. I had to be able to say, hey, man, you better not do that. If you do, you got to deal with this. I had to facilitate those conversations. And I'm sharing, a, you know, a lot more of those conversations as I go forward. But I want y'all to be able to ask questions. Like I said, I don't want to just talk at y'all. That's a lot of information. Thanks for listening. Hopefully you were able to understand a lot of that, but I'm open for whatever questions y'all might have. I haven't been looking in the chat, so if y'all gave me a heads up on time and all, <laughs> I didn't see it, so my apologies. But let's dive into some questions, y'all. How y'all want to do this, Marlon? How y'all want to do it? Well, first, I'd like to thank you for that powerful presentation um, and for you know, coming out. Um, we have a few questions from our graduate assistants that we'd like to answer and then in the audience uh please feel free to utilize the chat for any questions or you can use the raise hand function and we will um unmute you so you can put your question in yeah so i guess i'll go first then so it was hard writing my questions and listening to you you had so many good things to say and just your your story your life experience so I just wanted to ask um, many of us in the School of Public Health, uh, we imbue our values into our work and into our aspirations. So what lessons have you learned through the process of activism that you'd like to share for those of us who are up and coming in the field of public health? Um, you know, trust your gut in a lot of ways. You know what I'm saying? Like some sometimes we come to the table and we can get triggered and our trauma can show up. I mean, I've seen this with people protesting. I've seen people in strategy sessions where something is said and they triggered and it takes them back and they time travel. So it's like, man, like when people talk about self-care, like really like take care of yourself. Like if you're on a plane and it's going down, like they tell you to give yourself oxygen first. So that's what I would, you know, ask folks. Like I'm pretty grounded in that piece because I do so much work on myself. Like sometimes I think I'm going overboard, but I, um, I make sure I'm not out here just like showing up and feeling like I got everything under control. I never walk through life like that. I walk through life like acknowledging the hurt that has happened to me, acknowledging the hurt that I've caused to other people and being present, like letting my daughters know like, hey, I'm flawed, like I'm on point. But at the same time, like no angel, like I make mistakes like everybody else, but I try to minimize my mistakes. And if I do make a mistake, I'll come to you and apologize. Like people know that of me. So I think, you know, being able to let folks know, hey, you could hold me accountable. I think that's like a big part in this because a lot of times 
people want like minions around them. And it's like, why you want that? Like, why you want just people that's just going to ride for you, whatever, and just, you know, just, no, it's like, I like people who can say, like, I see David and some few, a few real ones in the chat. Like they know they can hit me up and say, Hey, I ain't cool with what you said. Like, I see Prince, man. Like, Hey, it's a lot of, Hey, I see a lot of good people in here, but they know they can say, Hey man, you said you was going to do this. Or you said this. I can, I'm, I'm willing to be checked and held accountable. I don't walk around out here just like I'm in charge or in control. So show up knowing that, you know, you want to be held accountable because it only makes you a better person. You know what I mean? Like, I know you got a career and a profession and something you chasing, but at the same time, it's like, don't miss out on loving people right in front of you, man. All of that, trying to chase this and go for this and self be self-made, all of that stuff is trash, man. We need people. So my work is about organizing our collective struggle. Like, how do we organize it to where it's survival? And it's not as much struggle because we're going to have harm. We're going to make mistakes. You know what I'm saying? You might hurt me accidentally. I might say something to you, hurt you accidentally. Like, I know it might feel a way, but it's like, let's deal with those emotions if we're trying to really, you know, like show how we can love and support each other. It's like, let's figure it out, even if it don't feel good. You know, like, let's sit through a process. So that's the best thing I could offer up. You know what I'm saying? Be present in all you do. Like, don't get lost in your ambition that you can't pick up the phone and call and tell somebody you love them or answer the phone for somebody, you know, it's like, you know what I'm saying? So that's why I said, I told y'all and I ain't been sharing it widely, but you know, I lost my father a couple of weeks ago. It's like, because I've done the work, I can go in that and say, dang, I can grieve what I wish it was. I could grieve that, you know what I'm saying? But at the same time, I'm just thankful he gave me life. And at one point he did marry my mom. So those things I could hold on to and I'm letting everything else go. So even going through that process in front of people allows other people to say, yeah, my relationship ain't the best with them. So that helps me. So a lot of times I expose myself. You see Peggy uh, Larkin in here. She's my lawyer when I was going for a pardon and she did an amazing job. And um, the Supreme Court struck me down. If I didn't have a community, I probably would be depressed. I probably I like I probably would feel it a lot more because it's like I know I can call her and say, you know, when we come back at them, let's do it like this or let's try this or it's still liberating even in my losses. Like so I can take losses in front of everybody and know that I'm gonna be good because it's people that's gonna call and say, all right, dust your shoulders off. You know what I'm saying? Like dust them off. We got a longer road. Let's lock in and everybody shows up with their capacity and shows up with love. So we ask people bring their you know, gifts to the table and everybody around me, we rise to the occasion. You know what I'm saying? Like people tell me stuff about software and I'm like, man, I'm not the technology person. I was going to jail and stuff like that when computers became hot and everybody was on it. But I always say, be patient with me, but I'm going to try and rise to your understanding of technology. So it's like, I try to work through the technology and, and everybody know like it's a struggle for me because those years I missed, um, in the streets and, you know, just going to jail and, you know, all of that stuff, the, the trauma, survival, all of that. So I, I'm just honest about what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. So if you can just be honest about that and say what you need help with and do it with love, that's what this stuff is about. Like I said, I'm trying to organize our collective survival. It's a pandemic, y'all. <laughs> like, for real, like, it's a whole pandemic. Who else? Oh, good to see Alex in here, man. If I go through here, Katana... Man, I can't name all y'all, but mad love, you know, for the people who in the Zoom. Any other questions? Yes, we actually had a question in the chat and it said, how do you deal with professionals who don't understand diversity and inclusion and how do you educate them? It depends on how they come into the table. If they come in with that like devil's advocate energy, I just probably like point them to the direction of reading some stuff you know what I mean like you need more education because I can tell your energy how you bringing this you coming from one of those antagonistic spaces you don't believe in what I like you coming to tear down you know like my belief system in a way and it's just like it depends on who they are if they somebody who I know in my life and I'm gonna know them and I know we gonna we got a meeting scheduled and all of that I take my time to actually say, hey, do you really want to understand it or you just want to challenge it? Because then I like, I'll take the time. If it's worth, if I feel like it's worth going deep into the weeds and educating and lifting them up, 
I do it. I make the time for it because if you say you're about diversity and inclusion, but I could look, I could just really do a quick scan <laughs> of your organization and all that. Like I could do a quick scan and say, yeah, it's more lip service than it is actual grunt work. You know what I'm saying? I point to my grunt work and you can see I've, you know, covered a lot of ground. If you say you're about diversity and inclusion, you should be able to show it. Like when I lift up Voices for Racial Justice or lift up Rep, like if I'm showing you, I co-struggle with a lot of groups. I'm teaching this semester. I got 32 students, two interns, and a TA. That's a lot to hold, right? <laughs> so it's like, I got to be in tune with them and let them know, nudge me if I'm not responding fast enough. Do the, so it's like, we got to figure out how we going to actually be in community with each other in a deeper capacity because I don't really like Zoom. I'm more like, in person <laughs> you know what I mean like people know I'd rather be in front of y'all and like hug you and stuff like that but it's like I've had to adjust you gotta think I've been in a like I've been incarcerated a lot of times so I definitely don't like sitting in one place so when I'm talking diversity and inclusion it's like are you willing to include somebody with felonies are you willing to include somebody who's been shot and who's in a gang are you willing to include somebody who I might have to leave early if my daughters need anything. Like, you got to think for a lot of years, I had to bring my daughters to meetings and stuff with me. I was that father you seen, like, hey, I might have one of my kids with me, but, hey, it don't stop nothing. They're going to listen. They're going to be over there on their laps. I brought my kids to class here at Hamlin because it's like I'm a very active father. I never put that on my wife. I put it on me. I'm going to figure out how to make all of it work. So I think, really, if you're talking diversity and inclusion, you just got to show it. You know, I don't, don't want to hear what, you got to show me. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't want to hear your five-year plan. What are you doing right now today? What am I saying today? Like, don't give me that speech. We got a three to five-year plan. Now, what's your six-month plan? Let's start there. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't take me in dreamland. Let me see six months. So I think it's just about showing them support. I know what affirmative action and all of that stuff was supposed to bring, but when you look at who benefit from that, it's not Black folks. You know what I mean? Like you saw a lot of black folks fighting for it and dying for it and getting lynched for it. But when you look at the recipients of it, it tells a different story. So when you're talking diversity and inclusion, just make sure they're showing it rather than just talking about their plan of it. I know that was kind of long, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that diversity and inclusion been a cold game, man. I've seen it used, I've seen it weaponized. So that's why I'm always like, man, don't, because a lot of people got to compromise their values when they're in that diversity and inclusion role. They got to, you got to give up something, you know what I'm saying? Unfortunately, sometimes you got to give up a lot of yourself, you know, when the flames cook. So I empathize with folks in those roles, but I also hold them accountable and say, we still expecting you to move with integrity, like for real, stand up for us when it's time to stand up. But also let us know when you're weak and when we need to, you know, roll with you. So we just got to, it got to be more love put into that diversity and inclusion work because I'm hearing it. And I hear the that you that folks look at diversity, but you really ain't including. Like the inclusion piece, you know, as well. It's like you talk about diversity, but that inclusion piece looking a little shabby. You know what I'm saying? You're doing well as far as talking about diversity, but the inclusion it should be streamlined a little bit better. Do we got other questions in the chat? I actually have a question. So would you say the prevalence of youth trauma and exposure in black communities is a strong contributor to why mental health related issues are prevalent in these communities? And if so, what can be done to change that? Like I said, it was nobody loving us. You know, we were smart and we did the best we could with what we had, but we didn't have anything. You know what I'm saying? What was the community center? What was the money being invested in conflict resolution? If I would have known conflict resolution like in second grade, that would have saved me a whole lot of trouble. <laughs> like, I mean, a whole lot. So it's like, man, like I'm trying to put love into my schools in Chicago. I'm trying to like make sure they get they needs, man. So that's what it was. We just needed like, I needed a fair playing field. 
if the field was even close to being fair, I would have dusted a lot of my peers. You know what I'm saying? But it wasn't no fair playing field. So how do we make it fair? You know, that's what I would really want us to struggle with to where my neighborhood could look like some of the neighborhoods y'all grew up in. How do we do that? Then we talking to real equity. It's like, how do we actually make that happen? It's like, we couldn't take no trips. And my mom worked hard, like I say, 28 years at the post office. And we still couldn't make it out. So the way you got to think, what's all the quality of life? You know, so you think about how much we arrested or how much we pulled over. You think about health care for us. You think about um, opportunities in our communities. You think about uh, how we over-policed. You think about all of these things, man, unemployment rates, houselessness. I told y'all about being evicted. If you don't got nobody to love you through that stuff, you might make the poor decision, man. If y'all grew up where I grew up, you probably would have sold drugs. For real, like, it was wild being with my sister in Chicago and have to bury my father. But when we was at the funeral home, she was like, Jason, you remember I worked here? I said, you worked at Gatlin's? And if you know Gatlin's, you know, they bury a lot of people on the south side of Chicago. I say, Toya used to work. We call her Toy. Her name Latoya. The nickname just Toy. <laughs> so it's like, I said, Toy, you worked here? She said, yeah, remember I was 18? I, was, I thought back. She worked in the flower shop. Think about this. This like movie stuff. I'm the paper boy because that's the only thing you <laughs> My sister worked at a freaking funeral home in the flower shop. It's like, man, we was trying to hustle as best we could. To, if we had real jobs or, or like any kind of access to something positive, we would have took it. And it's like the gangs. And I grew up watching the Nation of Islam. I grew up like Branch Temple number two was about five blocks from my house when I was a freshman in high school. So it's like after we got evicted, we moved around 75th. And that's the area I say really made me. 74th, Stony Island, 75th and Jeffrey all of that Essex, all the way to the lakefront. That's the area I say made me. I give a lot of credit to it. But you think back then, it was like, 94 was a bloody summer, y'all. That was, I mean, they ran out of ambulance. They was just picking people up and just regular Tahoes and stuff, man. I was like, what the? I couldn't understand it. So when you, when you say deal with our childhood trauma, we had so much of it. It was just like, I mean, kids couldn't get their teeth fixed. You got to think, man, it's like, it's survival. You had to be like a superhero to make it out of that stuff, man. Come on, man. Like, if y'all really think, y'all see the movies about Cabrini Greens and, you know what I'm saying? Like, we weren't supposed to make it. I'm glad. And I'm one of the lucky ones. Think about that. I've been shot and I've been to prison. And I'm one of the lucky ones. So that just lets you know it wasn't nobody there for us, man. It wasn't nobody and I had like a knot in my stomach with the generation above me because I felt like they let us down, man. Y'all got hooked on drugs at a time where we needed y'all to protect us, man. Like all these single parent homes, you think about CPS, my fights in school, man, they was always asking about my house. I knew, just don't say nothing. I knew, <laughs> I knew you got a right to remain silent. You ask anybody, I've, that's why I've never made a statement in my life. You look at me, I never got a statement on paper. Cause I like I knew that out of everything else. Shut shut it up. So I knew what Miranda was <laughs> very early. Miranda v. Arizona. I might not have known the case law, but I knew it mean you could just be quiet and you know they got to deal with it. So a lot of these communities need to know their rights, sis. You know what I'm saying? I appreciate them. Know your rights really work mutual aid and support people in the real way, loving way. Um, and just dig in, man. It's people who didn't have the opportunities y'all had, man. For me not to have, be able to take trips. And it's like I said, I just, this is the first time in my life I got a passport. I've been entangled in the system all these years. I had 20 years of probation at one point. You know what I mean? So it's like, I still feel when I'm three-fifths at time. Like Kevin Reese always say, like, man, I know when I'm, like, I, I have my days where I feel my three-fifths. So it's like, man, it's like, you got to fight for your freedom in America. You shouldn't have to do that. You know what I mean? So I make, the, I put the system, you know, I like, I look at them as criminal because we shouldn't have had those experiences we had. You know, it's like 13th Amendment is real. I know that was a long-winded 
<laughs> Damn, so much. welcome to my mind, man. Like, I be having to like get this stuff off. Keeps me light. Anything else? Marlon, did you have anything? Sorry, I'll just but... ask um, the audience if you had any questions. Just feel free to um, utilize the chat. Raise your hand. We can utilize or uh, enable your mic. So we do have a time for one or two more questions. But I want to lift up a book somebody gave me today. Like I'll wait if somebody want to <laughs> jump in, but I don't want to miss the opportunity. Hey, appreciate the love, y'all. Gratitude to y'all for real. Like I see it. I feel it. I receive it, man. Sending it right back. Somebody gave me this book earlier. I don't know. This book look amazing. I'm not, man, I got this book about two o'clock. They gave it to me as a gift. Y'all look up this book. If I'm wrong, just tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> but this book looks freaking amazing. So I just want to lift this up. I don't know if it is amazing, but, <laughs> but I just wanted to lift that up. I look at the theory part of all of this stuff, y'all, but the real life application means a lot to me. We're trying to br bring Phil Vance home, y'all. He been in there 19 years for a crime he didn't commit. So it's like, I'm so grounded in the work where it's like, I talk to people who are still oppressed, still, you know, subjugated. Thank you. Um, y'all, Rebecca Wirtz, man. Yeah, that's U of M. Hey, that, them new peeps right there. Good to see y'all on here. So it's like, we got to think of the ways where, how do you create safe communities everywhere? How many calls do you have before you have to call the police? I want everybody to be safe in this journey. You know what I mean? That's what I feel like my work is at this point. Prince, I'm gonna hit you up, man. I know you want me to come, you know, rock with some of your people, man. I see you. I'm gonna get back ASAP. Just wanna put that out there. But um, I'm grateful to even be able to have a story to share. It was years when nobody cared what I was doing. I was off the map. Like many people in the chat, man, just wiped off the map. When I was in solitary confinement, I felt like I was off the map. I'm grateful to be a voice for folks who don't have a platform. And I'm never going to forget like where I came from in this stuff, because I always want to be able to go back. And I always do go back. So I'm grateful to even have this to be able to provide. What to say? What guidance advice do you have for Black people employed in government public systems that have per perpetuated so much harm to Black bodies? Oh, man, absolutely. Amazing question, Prince. Um, I would say you know, um, change the game. Don't let the game change you. You know what I mean? That's what I tell anybody black or indigenous or person of color in those places, man. Don't let them compromise your values. You know what I'm saying? Any office y'all been in of mine, whether I was in the mayor's office or wherever, y'all know it looked like a black history museum. <laughs> so I'll, I'll let you know, you know, where my values are, wear it on my sleeve, literally. And um, I just don't compromise. Like, I'm not going to sell out for a check. So at the end of the day, I'm always looking at it like with the mentality of a free agent, where it's like, no, nah, it's too many ways for us to succeed at this point, man. I be talking to people about NFTs and all that stuff. I don't know if I'm gonna ever do that, but <laughs> like, I like I like learning, you know what I'm saying, and hearing it. So it's like for me, I always feel like, yeah, I'm gonna put my heart and my soul and all my work, everything I do, and at the same time acknowledge. Sometimes you gotta close some doors so that other doors open. You know, you don't want to hold on to something so strongly and so tightly that you miss something because you was afraid to let go. You know what I'm saying? So, like I say, I go through the pain and I share it with other people. And it's easier to go through that pain when I can talk to other folks about it. So I'm not against therapy. So to folks who are working in those governing places and feel that conflict, where it feel like you got to be a buffer in between the community, you got to stand in an uncomfortable spot. Make sure you talk to a therapist or somebody, man. Like, for real, man. It was so taboo. And so, like, so many years ago, people would look at you like you, something was wrong with you. I was like, man, my wife a therapist. So if I need to, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I, I, I don't want to put my labor on her. I, like, I never do that. Like, I do my own work. It just wouldn't be fair to dump all my stuff. <laughs> like, she got to be a mom. She got, you know, a mom and siblings and all. It wouldn't be fair to do that. But worst case scenario... <laughs> Like, I'll be able to say, hey, I'm struggling with this and I need you to help unlock this for me. But I don't got no shame in talking to somebody else when I'm hurting or I feel like if this situation with my father passing away becomes more than I can really handle, you better believe I'm talking to somebody. Like, 
I'll pick up the phone and say, fam, I thought I was good. I'm really not. Can we meet for lunch? It's not hard, y'all. So let me stop, man, because sometimes I'll be giving an answer and it just turns right into a rant or it turns into something. <laughs> so, so I'm good, man. Any other questions? I know we're going over time now, so I want to be respectful. All right, so it looks like we are um, good with questions. Once again, Jason, thank you so much for um, coming out, presenting, taking the time. Very much appreciate it. Thanks for having me, y'all, for real, man. This was time well spent. This made me feel good. So thank, <laughs> thank y'all, for real, man. Shout out to y'all organizing this. You know, like, I see y'all, like, thanks for putting in that work, even making the extra time. So much love to y'all. Thank you.